Good evening. Last night, um, I uh, ran into a lot of folks uh, coming back from dinner, and we kept it going for a little while. Uh, it was fun, but that's what, you know, we're supposed to have fun while we're doing this too, right? Um, so we're day two, and very excited about today's agenda. We've got a lot of really good, interesting topics going on, um, small business and innovation, ch child care, uh, quantum tech industry. Uh, actually, we'll have Senator Bob Corker in one of the sessions. Great to have uh, the senator here with us today. So, um, and then we'll come back into this room after the sessions and uh, wrap up uh, with uh, lunch. And here's some comments from Governor Lee. He'll be here. And then we'll be after that, and I'll talk about this later, but we'll have uh, the photos after Governor Lee is, uh, concludes his remarks. Uh, just a couple housekeeping items, just so everybody is on, on uh, the same schedule. As soon as this session wraps up, I uh, ask that everybody um, leave the room as, as quickly as you can, because staff has to come and get this room turned around for lunch. So there's a lot that they need to do to make that happen. So just appreciate you all as uh, soon as the session wraps up, uh, heading out to the hallways, and you can certainly network out there. Um, also, just as a reminder, the giveaway winners will be announced on the screens on either side of the stage at lunch. So as we're having lunch, be, be looking out uh, for the giveaways. We got some, some really good things to, to uh, hand out, and I'm excited about that as well. So uh, I'm excited about this morning session. So uh, the quick <clears throat> backstory here is that I'm on the, um, uh, the Blue Oval City Authority Board, and uh, four or five months ago, we were having our board meeting and broke out into some um, uh, presentations, and uh, we had a presentation that was given to us uh, called HTL University, and I was very excited about uh, the presentation and what I heard, and it was all about workforce, uh, and you all know that workforce is probably one of the greatest opportunities, greatest challenges we have in our state, but what was so interesting and intriguing to me about the presentation was how three superintendents in a community came together, understanding what those specific unique challenges are and collaborating in a way that would help address the need. You know, Blue Oval City with Ford Blue Oval City is going to create a significant amount of jobs in that region. So we have a, a group of individuals and leaders in the community that came together to address the problem and address the challenge really and the opportunity um, HTL University, HTLs, Haywood, Tipton, Lauderdale counties, as you all know where Blue Oval City is, those are the three counties uh, most mostly impacted uh, right there, ground zero. Uh, Blue, uh, HTL University will be the first rural district collaborative in the nation to respond in partnership uh, to the industry needs. Uh, the, pre the partnership includes the students, educators and the families. You'll hear more about this. They'll uh, we'll get a presentation here and walk through what HTL University is all about. So I'm excited about it. We have uh, the three superintendents here. Uh, the, the first who I'll introduce is Dr. Uh, John Combs, superintendent of Tipton County Schools. Uh, Dr. Combs began his career in the Tipton County School System 30 years ago at high school English teacher and is now serving his sixth year as superintendent He's also served as a counselor, coach, principal, and TIF grant coordinator. Also with us today, superintendent from Haywood County Schools, Amy Marsh. Uh, she began her career as a teacher and has served in public education for over 25 years. Prior to becoming a superintendent, she has served as a district official for student services, assistant principal and, princ assistant principal, and principal. Lastly, Sean Kimball, who is the superintendent of Lauderdale County School System, started his career 25 years, uh, a 25 year career at Ripley High School where he served as a career technical teacher, assistant principal and deputy superintendent before becoming superintendent. In 2021, Lauderdale County Schools was selected as one of eight districts statewide to mentor other districts participating in the Tennessee Literacy Implementation Network. So, uh, guests are on stage and so what I, what I, I'm going to hand it over to them. They're going to walk through the presentation for you all to sort of 
brings you awareness around what they're doing. And I think, again, what, what's so intriguing and what I'm hoping that you all get from this is that you've got leadership coming from a, a region from three counties that have really identified an opportunity and they're coming together sort of organically grassroots to bring solutions to the table. So that's what's so exciting from, from my perspective is, is, you know, it's not coming top down. You know, there's a lot of things that we try to do in Nashville and the tower, but really at the end of the day, it's all about the, the communities figuring out how best to, to serve their communities and solve problems. And so with that, I will hand it over to you all. Thank you all for being here. Really, they're busy people too, and they, they left their <laughs> districts uh, late yesterday afternoon. There's a lot going on and they all got here and, and I'm very thankful for you all spending your time with us this, this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, uh, for having us. And um, when we were asked to come do this, I don't know that we envisioned that we would be <laughs> sitting in a general session in front of several hundred people in chairs. Uh, this is not the environment that we have uh, usually been presenting in, so a little <laughs> different for us. It's kind of like a maybe a big episode of Dr. Phil or something. That's what I've been in this chair. But just give a, a, a little background on the, the history of the concept and, and of HTL University. And just to clarify, HTL University is not a place, but a concept. And when we heard about Blue Oval City and what it was, what was coming to our region, um, we superintendents, of course, work closely together. We already had uh, an, an industry development uh, and an, in, an industry um, recruitment um, agreement between our three counties called HTL Advantage. So. For scale of, of, of purpose, it kind of seemed like that it made sense to stay with, with our three counties, not that we were trying to leave anyone else out, but it really was about economy of scale. But as we were thinking about how we could work together, we knew that Blue Oval City presented um, the biggest economic um, shift or, uh, or investment in a region. And we certainly, as K-12 educators, want and, and need to see our community and our students and our parents successful. And so... We took it upon ourselves to start reaching out and, and, and trying to figure out what the big idea was around, uh, around this initiative. And really for us, it was more about just um, uh, the collaboration. Uh, that, that's what ended up being the big idea is that three rural counties could come together uh, to try to do something um, pretty innovative. So along the way, I, I wanna say that we have, we've done presentations for groups as uh, Commissioner McWhorter mentioned uh, we, we, we've presented to the Megasite Authority, we've engaged with the governor's office, we have uh, met with THEC and TBR, and uh, I don't want to leave anyone out, but um, it, just tons of different folks around how we can make this successful and we can partner together. So I don't want to leave that out because folks have, uh, at the state level, state government has been really supportive. Uh, the Tennessee Department of Education just come on recently uh, and, and has been supportive of this, so we're, we're Getting close to implementation, parts of this plan has already been implemented, but we're also working toward uh, future implementation. Um, but I will, um, I will turn it over to uh, my colleagues, and they're going to walk through uh, a good bit of um, what HTL is exactly. And you can see that um, uh, we have spent a good bit of time um, refining and um, and making this plan fit the resources that we have available. So, Dr. Combs, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you. And I, I do agree. It's, it's good to be here. Thank you all. I, I do feel a little Captain Kirkish in this chair. <laughs> uh, I do have to say it's much more comfortable than behind the podium, uh, but I don't think I'll make a habit of it. Um, will you advance my slide for me there? Oh, yeah. Mr. That's Kimball. Me. Thank you. Uh, so this next slide, is, as you can see, uh, the three of us geographically, as Sean mentioned, surround Blue Oval City. Um, we are all also neighbors to the largest school system in the state of Tennessee, and that's Shelby County. Shelby County is by far uh, the largest school system in the state out of about 143 systems. So we do um, have a challenge there in that, uh, you know, there's always, as you know, there's a teacher shortage. Uh, so uh, there's a large competition there. Obviously, they are uh, able to pay a little bit more than uh, some of the smaller rural surrounding counties. And so there are always things that we're looking for uh, as far as ways to draw more people to our area. Um, we're, you know, between 30 minutes to an hour outside of uh, uh, north of 
of the Memphis area. So we're always looking for opportunities. And obviously, like I said before, geographically, we surround Blue Oval City. You can, you can leave my house. I live in Covington, Tennessee. You can drive out of my driveway and get on site at Blue Oval City in 30 minutes. So we're, we are very close uh, to the mega site. Um, and obviously, you know, our, our people are an investment that we're making as well, not just geographically, but uh, we have a, a great number of folks who will be there. And as you can see from the slide behind me, um, there's a, a quote from Mark Herbison that, that we like to use all the time, and I'm going to read it to you. It's there on the slide. When you look at just four, uh, those four, or those three counties, uh, Haywood, Tipton, and Lauderdale, 72% of our workforce are over 22,000 people a day drive out to work in a larger county. So we've got enough people today who could run a car plant three or four times over. Now, that's a, that's a resource that I'm afraid could be neglected if we don't use it correctly. Um, I've been a resident in Tipton County for, I'm in my 31st year in the school system there. Um, my wife works in Midtown Memphis. So she makes that drive from Covington to uh, uh, Union um, in, in Midtown and has done it for 30 plus years to get where she's going so that we know we have that transient population who can be there. So as you can see, we have over 55,000 working age adults between the ages of 25 and 64 in our three counties, and over 12,000 of those have an associate's degree or higher. And then when you consider our K-12 system, which obviously we're the most proud of, we have approximately uh, 16,000 students being served across 13 elementary, six middle, and six high schools. And then around 1,200, between the three of us, about 1,200 high school graduates every year. And millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of scholarships that are offered to those individuals who graduate from our high schools. So we obviously want to create a system where we can maximize the talent and the capacity uh, that we feel like we have available uh, there. So how do we get started? Sean kind of mentioned that a little bit before. Um, this was kind of an idea that we had, uh, I guess it was about a year and a half ago maybe, um, and we started again talking about how we can compete with some of the bigger entities that surround us. And you know, we're, um, we have some pride in our children. Um, we think our students can compete with anybody, uh, not just in Tennessee, but anybody on the planet. Um, we, we have some great kids, and a lot of times I think uh, that's, uh, that's overshadowed when you live uh, next to such a large area, a large um, area like, like Shelby County. And of course, with Blue Oval City being built right in our backyard, we want to make sure that we're gearing up our kids so that they're, uh, they're ready. So we engaged with SCORE and worked with Boston Consulting Firm. Uh, as you can see there, we did a, a data deep dry, dive across three districts, and we engaged a number of stakeholders to find out the information that you can see there uh, on the slide and STEM and industry-oriented K-12 initiatives. So as a result of this process, um, we do feel clear on the vision and goals that we're seeking to pursue. So um, we are determining that our three districts will work as a network um, to begin this HTL University to ensure that we're maximizing the efforts that are necessary for our children. Again, we, you know, right now, I guess we're maybe seeming a little selfish in that uh, we're just using our three districts, but we intend this to be a model. That's, that's the whole plan. We want this to be something that can be replicated not just across the state, uh, but across the country when you have industry such as this that, that moves in close so that others can do the same. I mean, you all have industry uh, that you know that, that's close to where you live, and we think this is something uh, that could be replicated uh, where, wherever we go there. So. As you can see, um, every student in the HTL footprint will graduate high school with more uh, than a diploma. Um, you know, again, we feel very strongly that, that our kids can compete with anyone, and we want to make that offer. Now, you know, sitting up here as a public school superintendent, you know I have to say something about state testing, right? I'm not a fan. However, um, state testing is kind of a, a necessity uh, when you're uh, in, the, in the public school sector, but... To me, state testing is not an indicator of success. The indicator of success for our kids is post-secondary readiness. That's the indicator. Feel free to raise your hand in this room if when you had your first job interview or your first college interview, the question they asked you was, how did you perform on your eighth grade state testing? 
That's what I thought. Of course, I'm blinded. I can only see like four of y'all because of life. <laughs> but I'm hoping that no one raised their hand. Um, that's kind of where we are right now. I mean, we have to get our kids ready post-secondary, and that means we get them ready four-year, two-year, uh, TCAT, apprenticeships, industry certification. We're getting them ready for what they're going to see, and I think something else that may come out later, I don't remember if this is my part or not. I tend to bird walk, and that is that, um, you know, right now we're focused on Blue Oval City because it's so close, but we're hoping this works with any industry, not just Blue Oval City. We're preparing our kids to get ready for whatever they're going to see next. We also know that we're at a point in the evolution of K-12 that our educators, uh, ourselves included, are overdue for a little bit of an upskilling so that we can be ready for what's going to be next. You know, gone are the days where you sit in the classroom or you stand at the podium, uh, like I mentioned earlier, and, and you lecture to your kids and they get everything they need and then you, and then you dismiss. It's not like that anymore. Um, our educators have to adapt to what's in front of them, and this is going to be another way to be able to do that. And then, uh, of course, the last one involves families, and, and you can see that there on the slide. So, you know, we, I, I believe, as educators have found that um, it's, it's really easy to convince the kids. It's, th that's easy. You know, tell them, look, uh, it, they are under this impression that the only way they can be successful is to go to a four-year university. And um, that's something that has been placed on them by society and by their parents who think that's the only way to be successful. And we all in this room know that is just not the case. I mean, a four-year university piece is not for everyone. It is for a number, but it's not for everyone. So we have to make sure that they know all their options moving forward. And that's another big piece of the HTL program is to make sure that, that those kids and their families know everything that's there in front of them so that they can be prepared uh, to meet what, what may be there. And again, you don't have to convince the child. You have to convince mom. And you have to convince dad, right? Because they're the ones they are going to push back and they're the ones that are going to be behind there making sure that they have that, uh, that, they have that ready. Uh, next, or is that is the next one mine or am I good? So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Miss Amy, the director of schools for Haywood County Schools. So you heard... John talk about students, families, and educators. So what you see behind me is basically a six pillar program to support all three of those groups. And when you kind of look at it at the 30,000 foot level, it's really about partnership and advocacy. And it has to be about that because as investments come into our communities, whether that's families moving into the communities, um, philanthropic investments, post-secondary institutions, or even industry expansions, we have to make sure that we have a partnership and a structure in place to support all of that, right? So this is where we begin with that work. And you'll see the six pillars there, that first section, which is really small right here, but really big back there, um, talks about students. And the, the first three pillars you see under students really outline how we're going to support children in the school setting. That first pillar is all about elementary, and it's about project-based learning, it's about STEM curriculums, and it's about innovation studios. Because we all know if you have children, you kind of know at a pretty early age what it is they want to do, right? You know if your child's inquisitive, if they're science-based, if they're math-based, if they love to read. And that pretty much projects itself into what they do in the future. So we want to start early with children, as early as kindergarten, really getting them interested in what it is they may want to do in those STEM-related fields. Then as we get to high school, we got to narrow, or middle school, I'm sorry, we got to narrow that focus a little bit. We got to start looking at career and interest inventories and career opportunities that might interest them based on those aptitudes that we saw in the elementary setting. Then as you progress to high school, you really want to strategically narrow that focus so that you're talking about work-based learning, dual enrollment, um, increasing CTE partnerships. For us right now, that means mechatronics, among other things. But over time, of course, those things can change. But these are the ways we really want to support children in the academic setting. But that's only one piece, right? John talked about a lot of those partnerships and how they expand over time. So how do we support our educators in the school setting? And that really comes down to two things. It's ensuring that we have a strong group of advisors who really can support children in understanding um, advisement on those post-secondary and workforce opportunities, but it also means making sure that we have a healthy pipeline of instructors. 
instructors that have been exposed to industry, instructors that are um, ready to teach those STEM and in-demand pathways, and again, coming back to mechatronics as being one of those that is currently in demand right now. So that's how, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that educator development in a minute in a, a little bit greater detail. Then we have the last piece, which I always say, if you've heard me say this at the Megasite board or wherever else, is kind of my favorite piece because it's the wraparound piece that pulls all of that together. This is where we connect families um, and to workforce development. We offer them their families' college courses. We give them field trips and opportunities to see this in action because, like John said, it's about convincing the parents. And I'll keep my little story very brief, but I was the mom who said, my, my son's going to college. He's not going into CTA pathway. He's not going into workforce. And I was really cramming a square peg into a round hole. He was a pathway kid all day. He went to a four-year college and now works in the CTE industry. Um, and, and that was what he was meant to do all along. So it's important that we educate families on what it is their children can do with this work but also how they can benefit, because this is about our communities, right? So not just showing them what their child can do with this, but what can they as a family do to expand their workforce opportunities within our communities. <laughs> so we talked about how we are going to upskill our educators, right? And that's what this slide is all about. It's really about building a pipeline of instructors through fellowships. It's really a way to not only attract, but retain them over time. Because if you've paid attention to education for even a minute, you know that teachers are hard to find right now. 15 to 20 percent, and that's probably conservative, of our educators are not licensed. So we want to find a way to retract them and, and retain them. And we know as our populations grow, as a result of the industry that's coming to our areas, our need for teachers are going to grow because the number of families in our areas are going to grow. So this is really three ways, three STEM fellowship opportunities that basically reward teachers who come in with a bachelor's for either getting their master's in education through an employee preparation program or um, for getting a degree um, that, an undergraduate degree in the STEM area of focus. Basically, the longer they stay, the more we support their educational development to become educators. So this is a way to keep them in our area. So how do we do that? We've talked about how we want to support students. We've talked about how we want to support educators. We've talked about how we want to support families. And we've even talked about how we want to grow so that we have more qualified educators in our buildings. But at a global level, across districts, even across the state, how do we support that? And it's all about a support model. And that's what you see behind you here. Uh, a district, regional, and state level team that really works together to make all of this happen. And with HTL, and John really emphasized this and I want to re-emphasize it, it's not just about our three communities. This is about a pilot program that can be replicated as new economic development comes into any of our areas, right? So this is a way we can grow those programs as those opportunities emerge. So what I want to do is kind of walk you through those three teams. And what you see are a district team, a regional team, and a state team. And we'll take just a few minutes to talk about each one of those. So first we have that district team. And this is really the boots on the ground. These are the people in schools. These are the people working with children. And these are the people that are making the learning happen. So in a K-12 district, you're going to have, of course, the superintendents, um, which may or may not always be us, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes. But then very important are those middle school, college, and career coordinators. We talked about interest inventories and aptitude testing. These are the individuals that really design and lead exploration around post-secondary opportunity and industry opportunities for not just our students, but for our educators and for our families. They will work really closely with those next two groups, the high school advisors and the EPSO coordinators. And those high school, um, EPSO, uh, the high school advisors um, manage student success in high school regardless of the pathway they're on, whether it's college, career, post-secondary CT, whatever it is, they help manage that process to ensure that children move through these pathways at an accelerated rate. And then last but not least, very important are those EPSO coordinators. Um, and they, what they do is ensure to find EPSO pathways aligned to the industry needs. And they ensure that we have 
um, that our students complete degrees and, and those credentials that they're looking for really at an accelerated rate and they manage post-secondary partnerships. So they, at the school level, even have very important roles, not just in what the students are doing, but how the families and communities see what the student opportunities are. The next group you have um, are the regional team. And because we have three districts here, and because we have um, Ford and SK who are gonna make a regional impact, we need a regional team to manage that, right? So these roles will really be a share um, partnership between the three districts and support all three districts. The first one you see there is a regional project manager, and there are really two people that, that assume that role. They support um, development, deliver strong partnerships, manage advisory committees, collect, collect data, manage progress toward goals, and even manage the shared resources. So they have a pretty big job across all three of those districts. Then we have our anchor post-secondary partners, really excited about that because what they do is assure aligned pathways and clear agreements that enable accelerated degree pathways for our students. And most importantly, not most importantly, but very importantly, they may also serve as a fiscal agent as we receive resources for this program. So that's a huge role there. Next, you see the apprenticeship coordinators. Um, they are industry, um, they, they work with industry and school districts to ensure that we have meaningful youth apprenticeships, pre-apprenticeships, and apprenticeships. They connect students and families to those opportunities throughout the region, and they track and navigate federal and state regulations as they relate to these apprenticeships. So making sure they're relevant, what they're doing is relevant, and what they're doing is moving children forward. And then last but not least among these regional roles, are the reconnect coordinators. Again, I always say that's my favorite part, the family part. Um, but those regional coordinators are huge because they're outreach to families who um, really help them understand the opportunities, help them understand the fi financial resources that are available to them, and really track them all the way through graduation. And again, pull those families back in so that they can see the opportunities that may be available for them, even though they're not actively enrolled in our school system, because this is really a community effort, right? So that, that reconnect coordinator is huge. And then last, but certainly not least, we know that this is an opportunity to learn. John has talked about that, Sean will talk about that more, but this is really an opportunity to learn and pilot a state level approach to economic development. Um, and that's why you need a state team to really make that progress. So this state team has state agency partners and a central project manager. Those state agency partners, which Sean alluded to, we are very grateful for. We have really had the opportunity to engage with a number of agencies over the last year and a half, particularly in the last six months as this has begun to take some traction. We've worked with the governor's office. We've worked with um, THEC, TDOE, TBR, um, uh, Tennessee Development, ECD. So lots of people that have served as thought partners to us as we came up with this program telling us what they can support, what it is that's needed, where industry is going. Um, so those have been very important roles to us and we're very thankful to those as, we, as we've worked through this. But finally, we need a central project manager. We talked about a regional project manager at the regional level who manages all the regional pieces, but this state level um, project manager is really the one who manages state level engagement and really supports that and ensures that all these agencies and all these resources are working together to produce the final product that we want for our children, our families, and our communities. And so last but not least here, but and certainly not least because this is a huge piece, um, we know that all the roles you just saw need a consistent seat at the table. This isn't just our idea. This is an idea that has developed through collaboration with many, many, many different agencies, communities, community leaders, state leaders, government leaders across the board. So we want to make sure everyone has a seat at the table um, as we launch this and we build it out so that it can be sustained over time. We want to make sure because we will not be, you know, I, I hate to say it, but I'm getting old. And in 20 years, I will not be the superintendent for Haywood County Schools. I hope to be at home with grandchildren in a rocking chair, but or, or some kind of chair, maybe a recliner. I don't know. Not this chair. These are pretty good. Yeah. 
Um, but what we know is that in order for this to survive over time, we need systems, structures, and partnerships in place that outlast us, right? And this is what this is. This advisory committee, and, and I'm not going to read to you, you can see all the different groups that are composed of this, but there are a couple of very important pieces that go with this. This advisory committee ensures ongoing alignment. Because think about what has changed just in the last 10 years. Go back last 20 years. The year my daughter was born, a flip phone was the thing. Remember you had to press the button three times to get one letter? Remember that? Think how much things have changed and think how much they will continue to change over time. And what this advisory committee does is make sure that education and industry keep up with one another over time and that they're aligned. The role here is really initiative rollout, impact tracking, very important, strategy support, funding support, and model expansion. And we keep going back to that model expansion because we really want this to be a pilot program, which is why two of the roles you see up there are important. The superintendents, whomever they may be at that given point in time, to continue to drive the work because they know what their community needs. They know what their children needs. They know what their families need. But also, you see those pilot superintendents. And that's extremely important because that ensures model expansion over time. As we sit at the table and as we develop this out and build it and improve it and learn lessons from it, these pilot superintendents who sit in with us can take that back to their communities where they might have economic development and expansion and make it their own. So again, we want this, uh, our, our goal, I mean, if, if, if you don't know this by now, our goal is to educate. So this is a way to educate everybody at the table so that the final product for children and families that comes out the other side is strong, meets the needs and demands of the times, and prepares our children and their families for the world of work beyond K through 12 education. So I'm going to turn it over to Sean now, who will really start talking about next steps and, of course, the budget as we build out HTL a little further. Thank you. That's, that's good stuff. You've, you've sold me. Um, <laughs> but I think what, what you're hearing, I hope what you're seeing, is um, a model that when you're thinking about a collaboration between three uh, counties especially, Having people who are dedicated and put their feet on the ground every day to do nothing but this work that we've outlined is incredibly important for us. Because in rural districts, our supervisors, and you never know from minute to minute what, what we're going to be dealing with, we, you, you can lose focus really quickly. So something that's as important as this, having a management team that can, that can keep this moving and every effort that they make is to make sure that we are providing wraparound services for our students, our educators, and their families. And while we're doing that, you'll see on this slide um, that our success for the HTL footprint is that it rests on those strong partnerships. We can't do this alone. Uh, we will have a, a blended uh, approach of state uh, support uh, and philanthropic support as we work through this. And so as, if we're asking um, partners from the from state government or from other entities to put skin in the game they need to know that we mean business that we're going to be accountable to what we say we're going to do and we're going to follow through and uh, and and make sure that the services that we're uh, saying that we're going to deliver that we actually deliver so um, that's one key part uh, of uh, our success the other are the shared resources um, <clears throat> we were talking about EPSO, and I know educators are the world's worst uh, about throwing out uh, things and uh, acronyms and not uh, explaining them, but early post-secondary opportunities are a whole plethora of opportunities that students have from receiving industry credentials to do enrollment college credit, and the list goes on and on and on. Really what we're talking about here is setting a path that is not, no student leaves our three counties with only a high school diploma. Um, when we talk about those shared resources, making sure those shared resources are put in place to see that students leave our doors with either, uh, in many instances, we're already, I think our three districts are implementing middle college, leaving high school with an associate's degree, um, leaving high school with a TCAT degree, or leaving high school with multiple um, credits toward a college, um, if, if the four-year university pathways your way, making sure that we provided dual enrollment 
courses and opportunities that students are leaving our doors with 18, 21, 24 hours of college credit before they go to those four universities. Or um, I mentioned uh, multiple industry certifications in their uh, CTE pathway of study. Um, and so that, that's, that's our goal is that no student leaves our doors without the exposure to what lies ahead of them and what resources we can provide them to get to the finish line. And then I mentioned earlier about us being accountable and transparent um, to those that, that we're partnering with. And as, as Ms. Marsh mentioned, you know, you all are very, um, very smart about business and knowing uh, in your communities as leaders that a program that you don't monitor and you don't, um, and, and you don't um, spend time uh, making sure that people are doing what they're supposed to be doing just isn't very successful. So we want to hold ourselves accountable and knowing that in the future um, we may not be leading our districts, but we have uh, a platform and a program set up that will, will continue to make sure this progress moves forward and holds everyone accountable um, is, is incredibly important. Now, <clears throat> something like this is not cheap. Um, that's been, that's been um, the hard work uh, for, for us and um, trying to secure the funds to get HTL completely off the ground. And we have, again, multiple components of HTL that's already come together, already in, being implemented. Uh, and so we're, we're, we're getting really close to the finish line on that. So we're, we're um, uh, thinking that probably $8 million uh, we have invested collectively in this program through our Innovative School Models Grant through uh, through the wonderful work that the state did uh, to provide in K-12 districts with those funds. Uh, and we are, we're implementing um, many of these things again and providing uh, mechatronics and setting up mechatronics labs in each of our high schools across our three counties as well. Um, then you have, uh, I mentioned the launch funds. We, we need the project management team and we're working through that. But about $3 million in total for all of the different resources and positions that you uh, that you saw uh, earlier, and um, that's startup funds, and then we're thinking about four million dollars per year uh, across three counties to um, implement the program and to to sustain it and keep it running. And when you think about that over over a five year period, we're talking about an investment of three hundred thirty nine dollars per student. Now I know those numbers, those millions of dollars, make it sounds like a lot, but when you're thinking about the investment and the type of wraparound services that we're giving. Uh, our, our educators, our students, and our families, really $339 is not a, not a bad deal. So um, I, will, I think we're getting close to our, um, to our time to, to provide, uh, provide a little time for questions. But you'll see here that um, in, in this last slide that we've kind of outlined all of the state partners and uh, district teams and regional teams, and we have an implementation timeline, as I mentioned. And several of these things, again, are, are uh, planned or in place now in, in implementation or are planned for the future. So um, that's our story. Um, we've spent, a, like uh, Dr. Combs said earlier, about a year and a half of building this plan, researching it, uh, getting the right people to the table to help make it a reality. Uh, and we're uh, so thankful for, again, for all of those partners and especially ECD for uh, being a player at the table and really pushing this to, to make this uh, uh, a thing for, for our HDL University. So I'll stop there. I think we have a few minutes if there are any questions for our group. We might not be able to see you, but we'll be able to hear you. <laughs> Um, I'll answer first. Uh, we have kept our school board updated from the very kind of the very beginning, just of the concept, and not to get too far ahead of ourselves. But we, as we especially as we began to meet with uh, different state partners and having public meetings, like with the Mega Site Authority, we wanted to make sure that people had at least heard about HTL. Uh, and so, uh, so the feedback has been really good from our school board. And I think it was John that mentioned that we talk about this a lot, but it's usually in smaller groups, and that is those community settings where we talk to our county commissions, our city councils, um, even um, some individuals who 
we have different opportunities to um, engage with around Ford and SK. So we've had a lot of opportunity in our communities to share this, and it has been well received. And really those um, ISM grant funds have really helped kick that off so people can kind of begin to see what that looks like. And when you can see the reality, it's much easier to be invested in it. So that, that's been very successful for us in Haywood. I'll say in Tipton, we're, we're similar. I have presented it to my board and showed them some of this. However, I want to make sure that it, you know, it has a little more uh, uh, traction mm -hmm. before I you know, go into it really deeply. However, uh, they are on board with what I mentioned earlier, and that is that we know there are so many opportunities out there for kids that we're not taking advantage of. Yep. Uh, you know, when we tend, like I said, we tend to wait for that, you know, that, uh, that state report card to come out with test scores on it and everything else to think, you know, hey, this is what's benefiting kids. When in reality, like I said, we want to look and see, hey, what's ACT look like? What are we doing for our kids, you know, post-secondary? How many apprenticeships do we have? What's our partnership with TCAP? What kind of dual enrollment and AP enrollment type uh, coursework do we have? Uh, you know, that, that's what I've been, you know, presenting a lot to my board. I'm trying to find the young man that answer, a, asked that question. Somewhere. Okay, hey. So uh, <laughs> trying to make eye contact with you there. That's the thing, right? My, my father would be upset if I didn't do that. So... Um, I think that's a big piece is that we let them know, you know, what opportunities are, are out there. Uh, and I'll just throw this in. So, you know, we have a number of our kids that, that take dual enrollment mm -hmm. U.S. history, AP U.S. history in high school. I mean, a large, large percentage. Uh, do you know that none of those kids count on the state report card when it comes to testing scores? I mean, you know, there are so many things that are out there that, that stakeholders aren't even aware of. So, you know, we want to make sure that, that we're putting our best foot forward when it comes to, you know, what, what our kids can expect uh, moving forward. And, and the only thing I think I would add to that is when you have something like Blue Oval happening in your backyard and in your community, it becomes a, a lot more tangible, a lot more real to people. And so when they see it, as they see that building going up, as they see the people coming into the community, and we begin to talk about these things, they much more quickly see the value in it. And that's why this is really a pilot, because as economic development happens throughout our state and, and districts are in the same seat that we're in where it's happening now, you can really get ahead of that curve and get your community invested so that you're not coming in behind, you're not being reactive, you're being proactive. And that's really what we want to do with this program. Just a quick question. Is this on? Or doesn't matter. You can hear me. Um, Well, I mean, you know, obviously I'm sitting up here in this chair because Blue Oval City is moving, in, <laughs> moving into our neighborhood. So, um, you know, we've had, we've had multiple conversations with Ford. Mm -hmm. And I will say this, you know, again, my background is education and, and leadership. So uh, I didn't realize there were so many different entities involved in one entity. So, you know, <laughs> Ford, we spoke with like four or five different factions mm -hmm. of Ford. Uh, so, you know, and I think... A few of those were on the slide, actually. And it was confusing. You know, we'd, we'd meet with them and then think, wait a minute, didn't we just present to you? But it was a different group in Ford. So uh, that was a big one. Um, and then, I mean, industry-wise, can you think of another one that really, that really stood out? I mean, obviously, we spoke with, uh, you know, hospitals, and, and, and th th those stuck out some. Yeah, I think um, er early on, um, we looked at a lot of different workforce development kind of collaboratives across the nation um, and we didn't we we found pieces of htl but we didn't find one that was we feel like is comprehensive and addresses so many you know different needs of our of our community members so um, but yeah we the planning process and and uh, i don't even know i have some uh, shout out to our lauderdale county folks in the back uh, i think some of our folks uh, would have gotten they got calls from from our consulting group um, from local industry, I mean, for local industry uh, in Lauderdale County, not just for Blue Oval City, and we, so we uh, we spent some time researching local, you know, a little deeper local needs as well. So it was a pretty comprehensive planning process in the beginning of how to how to make the pieces fit. Now, I will say this too: when we, you know, when we engaged with some of these companies, again, I'll mention, you know, Ford. When we engaged and we looked at, 
the, the state standards that we, that we go by for, you know, what we teach our kids. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we showed those standards for, you know, specific uh, coursework to Ford. And they said, oh, that's not what that is. That's not, that's, that's not, that's not our definition of what that is. So, you know, that's taking some too, is, you know, re-engaging with Ford and other, uh, and other companies to say, okay, this is, this is what our state standards say as far as what, what we teach to children. And this is what we're saying, you know, this is what mechatronics looks like. And then, you know, Ford may look at it and say, okay, that's not what we call mechatronics, right? So we have to make sure a number of those things are aligned. And that's, that's taken a minute. We're still not there. Yeah. Uh, but that's a number of the things that we're hoping we can engage in with HTL is, you know, put some of those pieces together so those, those folks talk. It was amazing when we first started that, that you know, uh, Ford and TDOE really hadn't had a, a conversation uh, when they first came. Now, that has changed. I will say uh, they have been engaging uh, here lately, and which is great. But uh, on the onset, that was not a, that was not a thing. And that's where that last slide that I talked about with that advisory committee becomes so important because there are industry partners at the table. There are family members, um, all those different groups that ensure that the product that we're delivering for students and families really serves the needs of that community and the industry around us. Um, So that's why that is such an important piece because you want to make sure you keep up with the speed of change. Um, And right now it's lightning speed. Um, and so we don't have a group that's focused on ensuring that alignment, then we're already behind. The biggest eye, the biggest eye opener was Ford invited us to Dearborn. Um, and for us to actually see as superintendents what manufacturing looks like, <laughs> we had an opportunity to go to their advanced manufacturing center. And, you know, I just wanted to stay there and play. I mean, it was amazing the, the technologies they were developing. And I think it's important, for, as we mentioned earlier, for our families to see those kinds of things because manufacturing, especially advanced manufacturing, is not these dark, dirty uh, places that, that some parents may still have in their minds. And so uh, that's why you'll see, a, you saw a part of our program is about making sure that when we're talking about mechatronics and we're talking about the different uh, skill trades uh, that um, students can get through our partnership, what does that actually look like? And so we're That's making that a, yeah, we're making that a key part of our program. Mm-hmm. And you know, and Ford Blue Oval City is not just, it's not just Ford, right? You have all these other yeah. things coming up around it. You have the hospitality industry, the, I mean, sales, and I mean, all this stuff is being built around this place. And so, you know, we have to engage and get our kids ready for all of those. It's not just like, you know, we're pushing our kids to get ready for Ford. That's not it at all. You're pushing kids to get ready for whatever is going to be in front of them. And there's going to be a lot more in front of them than just Ford. And there are going to be so many different options there. And we have to make sure they're ready. We have one minute and 43 seconds for another question. (laughs) That's at least one good question, right? That's right. That's right. (laughs) Well, I'll just say... We have uh, crazy uh, wait time. (laughs) But uh, I'll just say thank you so much for having us and yes. an opportunity to share. This has been, uh, been, been great for us. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, that was great. Thank you guys um, for, for being part of this today. Uh, Amy, John, Sean, for coming in. Um, hopefully you, you all uh, got a glimpse of why we wanted to allow uh, them to sort of present this. This is so important. Workforce, as I said earlier, is one of the top uh, challenges of the state. And we, you know, we're here at GovCon, and the theme is economic development. And uh, we can't do anything without a strong workforce. And we do have, it is a strong asset for the state. When we're out competing with other states for projects, whatever that project may be, workforce is an asset of ours, and we get a lot of recognition for that. But we have a long way to go. A lot of other states do too, but it's these kinds of very creative and innovative ways of communities coming together to address the need, I think is why we're we're gonna win and continue to win. We need more of that. I wanted you all to see just an example. I know Blue Oval City, we've referred to that, is a very unique sort of unicorn project for the state of Tennessee, generational changing, but if if these things don't happen, uh, that project won't be as 
powerful as it can be and will be. So thank you all for, for doing this today. Just a reminder as we wrap up, uh, exit the room so we can turn the room over for lunch and uh, enjoy the next session. We'll, be, we'll see you back at lunch. Thank you.